Sean Worsley, a veteran, sentenced to five years in prison in Alabama for using medicinal marijuana, he'd been legally prescribed to treat a traumatic brain injury. Fair Wayne Bryan, 63 years old, sentenced to life in prison for stealing a pair of hedge clippers because 18 years before he had been convicted of robbing a taxi driver. Khalif Browder, a 16-year-old held in prison for three years in New York for allegedly stealing a backpack, charged but never put on trial. Beaten by prison guards and placed in solitary confinement for two years, he attempted suicide twice in prison. Still traumatized, he committed suicide at his mother's home after being released. These are just three drops in a sea of similar stories all across the United States. Why are these stories so common? One of the ugly truths about our country is that we lock up a higher percentage of our people than any other nation on Earth. In fact, we imprison more people than any other country, period. We are the biggest prison in the world. We have a significantly larger prison population, 2.1 million people, than China, a country with three times our population. Why does the United States lock up so many of its people? More than the entire population of New Mexico. Where did this wholesale imprisonment of huge groups of people, what we call mass incarceration, come from? Let's go back a few decades. Starting in the 1960s, many companies looking to cut costs moved production out of big cities like Detroit, Milwaukee, Cleveland, or simply automated away big chunks of their workforce. Their employees were left jobless, and manufacturing was ripped out of great cities that used to be synonymous with industry. After 1970, unemployment for non-college educated men soared, especially black people who were just then entering the middle class. People who could leave the cities, mostly middle-class whites, fled to the suburbs, a phenomenon we call white flight. This led to a vicious spiral. Cities lost tax revenue, schools lost funding, houses lost their value, local economies collapsed, job opportunities dried up. As urban poverty rose, crime rose with it. And the arrival of crack cocaine in the 80s, helped along by US foreign policy in Central America, made the problem even worse. By the 1970s and 80s, there was a full-blown social crisis in American cities, resulting in a steady increase in crime. Now, American politicians could have responded one way. They could have confronted the root causes of crime by reinvesting in hollowed-out cities, building a healthier, cleaner, more prosperous society. But that is not what they did. Instead, they unleashed a tsunami of incarceration. They chose to lock up millions of people, rather than accept the type of broad redistribution of wealth, jobs, and power that a real solution would have demanded. Mass incarceration is expensive, but for the well-off, it turns out to be a lot cheaper than actually solving the problem. So the US government decided to combine the harshest penal state in the world with the stingiest welfare state. And this carceral approach was also effective politics, with white voters terrified of rising crime from increasingly non-white cities, Republicans and Democrats alike saw a way to exploit racist fears and get cheap votes. It started with Richard Nixon's promise of law and order in 1968. Ronald Reagan vowed to get tough on crime in the 80s. By 1996, a Democrat like Hillary Clinton was warning of young, quote, super predators with, quote, no conscience, no empathy, people who must be, quote, brought to heel. Over those decades, politicians from both parties and at all levels passed harsher and harsher laws feeding the prison system. The war on drugs started in 1971. Cruel mandatory minimum laws came in the 1980s. Three strikes laws arrived in the 90s. You could be put away for life without parole for stealing a pair of socks if it was your third offense. Tough on crime prosecutors and judges gained office across the country. Huge sums of money were spent on building new prisons, which housed millions of people. As a result, incarceration rose dramatically. In 1968, America's prison population was 102 per 100,000 people. 
in line with other developed countries. By 2005, it had risen sevenfold to 737 per 100,000, the highest in the world. Even as crime fell, with murders in New York dropping 90% in the 90s, mass incarceration kept on growing. Why didn't prison populations fall once crime started declining? It's because prisons are by no means only about crime. They're also about keeping the least advantaged people in line. Prison has become the place to warehouse people with mental illnesses, people experiencing homelessness, and people with addictions that the system is not designed to help. Instead of solving these problems, we use prison to disappear the people who have these problems. With this surging population, prisons are crowded and violent. People in prison are robbed of their humanity, often brutalized by guards, and without real rehabilitation or good options for re-entry into society, are sometimes turned into the hardened criminals the system believes them to be. That's why academic evidence suggests that prisons make people more likely to engage in criminal behavior, not less. You can't eradicate crime without eradicating the root causes of crime, including prison. And it was poor and non-white communities that were the hardest hit. Hurt by deindustrialization and then criminalized by the state, black men born between 1965 and 1969 have been more likely to go to prison than to graduate from college. Less educated people in general are victim to this. A white man without a high school degree has a 25% chance of being imprisoned in his lifetime. A black man without a high school degree has a 70% chance. Mass incarceration has done massive harm to our communities, our families, our children, and to the millions of people caught up in it. Mass incarceration cannot exist in a healthy society. It is an intentional humanitarian disaster, a war by the ruling class on the poor and the marginalized. Mass incarceration is a choice, but it's their choice, not ours. This is Chase Madar, Professor of Law for the Gravel Institute.